Hello, everyone. I'm Sola May Tibabu. I'm the host of Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today with Lisa and Dr. Dumani. Thank you both for joining us. Before we jump in, how about some brief introductions? Um, how about uh, Dr. Dumani and Lisa next, please? Sure, I'm happy to be here. I'm Shelley Dumani, and I'm a senior medical director with Aetna. I'm a psychiatrist, uh, board certified in addiction psychiatry. And I have in my background a uh, fairly, fairly long history in family practice. And my initial foray into the addiction space was when I did a fellowship at the Addiction Research Foundation in Toronto back in the early 90s. And so I've been through a long journey with all the iterations in the space. And hi, everyone. I'm Lisa McLaughlin. I'm a co-founder and co-CEO at Work at Health. I'm a social worker and information scientist by training and also have a long history at working in addiction. First um, and foremost, I got sober as a young adult, so I have a patient as designer ethos that we've brought to building a company work at health, uh, but also um, in between undergrad and grad, worked in an addiction research center for a number of years at the University of Michigan, so I've been on the research side of addiction care, on the care delivery as a wilderness therapist, and then on the system side, building work at health um, to make more digital versions of care delivery available to people. Wow, both of you are so impressive and have done so much work and impact in the addiction space. I'm excited to dig into the partnership between Aetna and WorkIt. But before that, um, Lisa, maybe I'll start with you, just for folks who might not be familiar with WorkIt. I know you've expanded quite a bit in the last few years, both in size and scope of services. Can you give us an update on um, all the areas you serve now? Yeah, so Work It is really a digital addiction front door for care. Um, we started with opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder, delivering rapid access, low barrier treatment solutions. And it became evident over time as we knew as individuals in recovery that the patients we were dealing with had a variety of comorbid conditions. So we treat about 30 comorbidities today um, and are consistently out developing new clinical programs to meet the needs of what we're seeing in the epidemic. So a stimulant use program was recently released with contingency management. Uh, we're also launching an adolescent program. The goal is really to be a comprehensive digital clinic across the life course because this really is a lifelong condition that you struggle with throughout your life um, and need different services at different times. And so we treat you know, depression and anxiety as it co-occurs with addiction and underneath that umbrella of whole person addiction care. Oh, you, you brought up some interesting things, whole person care, co-occurring diseases. Can you talk about a little bit about uh, why it was important to work it to broaden from your initial focus of opioid use disorder? Yeah, just as a person in long-term recovery, uh, when Robin and I sat down to make work at health, we had lost a lot of friends and loved ones who had fallen through the cracks of the way care was designed in large part because it was very fragmented. So it was very much all or nothing. Either you were ready for a really intensive inpatient experience or you weren't really eligible for care. It'd be like if we just had stage four cancer treatments and no stage one, two, three. Um, so a lot of services were designed to be very intensive and inpatient. Um, but if we looked back at our own recoveries, the difference between my own sobriety and someone else's is that I lived near an academic medical center. I had good access to psychiatry. I had psychiatric services, comorbid with my treatment services. And that's why I'm alive today. And many people who follow different pathways are not. And so that fragmentation is something that we really wanted to look at because we saw that as the difference between doing well and thriving in long-term recovery. And that's what we've been able to build this really integrative approach that looks at all the things going on with the person that are inhibiting them from having triggers and cravings, which usually are co-occurring um, mental health disorders in about 70 to 80% of our population. 70 or 80%. Um, Dr. Dumani, I'd like to ask also in your experience, have you also seen co-occurring issues are quite commonplace? Absolutely. I think that 70 to 80 percent is entirely accurate. And, you know, to harken back to my early days in, uh, in addiction treatment, um, I worked, at, as I mentioned earlier, at the Addiction Research Foundation. We shared a city block 
with a major psychiatric center, part of the university. And people were constantly being shuttled back and forth from one place to another across the driveway because, oh, can't treat your cocaine till you manage your, your depression and vice versa. And the treatment outcomes were terrible. So we learned early on in that program that we had to offer a comprehensive solution to everyone's problems or you lose it. Um, there was also literature in the 90s that demonstrated that people with schizophrenia, if they were even asked to cross the street to uh, obtain addiction treatment, that the outcomes were awful. And so this kind of a program is really a welcome approach. And it's one of the reasons that at Aetna, we, uh, we chose to contract with you because we recognize the need for comprehensive holistic care. Wow, those are astounding examples. Thanks so much. Um, and Lisa, I want to go back to this uh, topic around adolescence. I think that's really exciting. Um, of course, an area I'm really passionate about. It seems like there have been a plethora of youth mental health startups, but there haven't been too many addressing addiction. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, this again, the need for this program was really apparent to Robin and I early on in Work It, but we weren't ready to tackle it because we understood that there would be serious barriers to clinicians coming on board with taking on the risk of addressing the population. But as a young person in recovery, pretty much half the population is young adult that's got a DUI or some sort of consequence as a teenager of adolescent drug use or individuals in their mid-30s. You see people across the life course, but there's these big, big groups of people in those two different demographics. So we always knew that this was a moment of willingness for people within their lives, where if they had really tough experiences, you could intervene at this time and be really effective. And also that so many states had zero services. So my own state that I grew up in, in the Detroit metro area, people were shuttled away to Utah, to Montana, to wilderness programs like the one I ended up working at because there were no real available services that were psychiatrically oriented in the state. There were intensive outpatient services you could go to. You could go to local AA or NA meetings. You could find um, lots of mutual self-aid style care, but a comprehensive treatment approach that kept you where you were living and that didn't sort of take you out of your habits and haunts was not very accessible. And it still isn't today. There still is um, a big gap there because mostly because of provider wariness to treat from my experience. So it just seemed like a huge gap getting way worse. And as a parent during the pandemic, I just see how much kids are going through. Um, and it seems to be something that we're going to see just accelerate enormously. And the addiction side of it um, has always been underserved, especially when it comes to MAT and harm reduction methods with kids. Absolutely. And of course, post pandemic or not, not even post yet. Um, and the Surgeon General's announcement, obviously, unfortunately, there's going to be even more uh, need or demand for these kinds of services for youth. Um, Dr. Dumani, have you seen anything on the youth front as well? Oh, absolutely. As you mentioned, the Surgeon General's report showing really a crisis in America with youth mental health and a lot of that has comorbid substance use disorders thrown in there. And as you mentioned, the lack of services for this group is really high. One of the things you mentioned, Lisa, that I really uh, want to emphasize is the need to treat people in their home communities. Because my experience has been across many years that when we have to send people away from potential natural supports, a potential healthy network uh, that are never engaged in treatment and they go thousands of miles away, they come right back into the setting where they've used and they don't have the skills or the support to manage it. So the ability to treat people in the home environment through digital um, services like yours is really key. Yeah, we like to think of it as, as an iceberg where really we've been treating, you know, the Americans that were willing to raise their hand and come out to the center, but almost everyone who really needs the care is under the water right now because they're, the formats of care are just not that accessible to them. And if they could have care in the home, you have just a completely different group of patients than you would have otherwise. I think sometimes people are like, how are you different from traditional treatment? One of my first answers is usually we don't always reach the same people. Uh, we broaden the tent so much that it's just a completely different group of people that will come in through this door than would come in through the more traditional punitive or probation related door um, that we're used to talking about in the public more broadly. Really good points. 
So with this expansion beyond your original focus of opioid use disorder, Lisa, what kind of learnings have come about since, since growing? I mean, for me, the biggest thing is I came from an abstinence-based recovery journey myself and had to come around to harm reduction through learning the science, understanding the science. But I think one of the key things that has been exciting about work, it's evolution, is that we went from early adoption, um, where we were really sort of ostracized by the traditional communities we got sober in, through this mass adoption phase of all the science and literature backing what we were doing, to now leading and peoples are following us. And that transition has been really powerful because it's allowed us to see what's next. And I think I'm really excited about, especially in the adolescent space, all of the overlap we're seeing with sensory processing disorders and things that are impacting reasons why patients do use when they're uh, adolescents um, that we can really get in front of much earlier, like seven to 12 um, as a preventative measure. And I never saw that before. I always thought, oh, I'm someone in recovery. When I have kids, it's going to be terrifying for them to reach adolescence because of the state of the field. And now I have a lot more hope and excitement about some of the interventions that are out there that can address some of the things that lead to using behaviors in the first place, where I don't think I could have said that early on or been excited or hopeful in that same way. That's really great to hear. And Dr. Dumani, I know you've been an early leader in this space. Have you also seen that transition in the industry as well? Oh, absolutely. When I moved to the United States in 1997, I came from a harm reduction model. And I was almost afraid to mention the word when I first started working here because people were, as you said, wanted to ostracize you. But it's really uh, been great to see that people understand, you know, the the stages of change. And if you don't meet people where they're at, you're going to lose them entirely. Um, I was I've been very distressed when I, I I still do maintain a private practice in addiction. And when I had to send people to higher levels of care or even to IOPs or PHPs, if they had a relapse, they were kicked out of the program. I mean, this was shocking to me, rather than trying to work with people and meet them where they're at and and give them goals that they're willing to address, you really retain people in treatment. And the interesting thing about harm reduction is there's also a great group of people who eventually decide that abstinence is is the goal that they want to meet, because it's so much harder to limit your use than it is to stop it. But they have to get there. They have to get there themselves. We can't demand it of them. And so I'm I'm just so thrilled that we have more and more providers like yourselves that really embrace harm reduction. Again, great examples. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I know that recovery coaching and counseling is also an important component of the work at health offering. Can you talk about um, why that was important to include and how that's affected care? Yeah, I think that It took me a long time in my own professional training before I went to social work school um, to get access to a strong set of CBT skills to support my own recovery, mostly key abilities to identify like auto thoughts, like maximizing or catastrophizing that were common triggers um, in my own you know, desire to relapse as an adult. I got sober very young. Uh, And then it became really evident to me that there was lots of form of forms of coaching and psychotherapy out there, but that they didn't all include that core basic curriculum that you really need to just get through life. Like I I give it to, you know, my kids now, just like, this is, these are life skills, but especially critical for people that are in recovery. So with work, it's coaching and counseling model. We're able to deliver that through our courses where they can be tailored to an individual and what's going on with them, but we're making sure that they get those basic skills to recognize negative thinking patterns and be able to change them. And I think that's just critical competency to living in recovery. And if you just have the medications, you're going to have that efficacy at preventing death. And there's a lot of data showing that like just medications alone are supportive in ending opioid overdose deaths, but to really get people to a place where they're feeling that they're thriving, they're going to have to get those skills that help them better feel more comfortable in their own mind that coaching, counseling, other forms of psychotherapies can give you. Right. It sounds like you really have um, all of the right solutions to be provided to the individual right when they need it. So um, thank you for that example. I'd like to ask you both this question. Um, 
I understand that the window of willingness can be brief for substance use uh, issues. Um, Dr. Dumani and then maybe Lisa, can you talk a little bit about how Aetna and WorkIt are working together to address this issue and, and how are you um, offering services to be delivered at the right time? Absolutely. So we've known for a long time that there is really a small window of opportunity to engage somebody when they're well entrenched in an addictive process. And if they have to wait even till the next day to be able to enact that sudden willingness to seek treatment and to get help, you you may have lost them. Uh, they may overdose in the meantime, or they may just plunge on headlong into, a, into another phase of their addiction. And so the ability to have 24-hour access to speak to somebody uh, who can outline for them a method and a time to get help almost immediately is really, really important. And this was one of the reasons when we were vetting various providers that we are very drawn to uh, folks like yourself who do offer that kind of instantaneous almost connection to a potential patient so that we can get them engaged in, in recovery. Well, thank you so much. I mean, from our perspective, we treat um, 60% Medicaid patient population, 40% commercial. And it's been important to us from an access perspective that People in pre-contemplation, no matter what type of phone they're coming from, internet-enabled situation they're in, can get into work it quickly. So where some companies may have focused on you know, flashy videos and their onboarding, our focus has been really tightly on get someone to the help as quickly as possible before they talk themselves out of it. And I think that's the patient designed differentiation that work it has. We've just been in those shoes. And so every touch point ends up having that sensitivity to the fleeting nature of the willingness. And we've been able to reach members directly where they are through our like consumer approaches. So we find members on TikTok, on Reddit, all over the internet where they're thinking about getting sober, where they might be on a WebMD quiz looking at, am I even eligible? Um, I had, for instance, an AA big book like five years before I got sober and just was sitting around. And so we want to be there lingering in people's heads when that moment transitions. So sometimes people will come to the site 13 times and then they'll sign up. But if there's lots of engaging content there, they can go through that pre-contemplative process with us and we're already starting the treatment before they've even seen a practitioner, which I think is key so that people aren't scared to toe dip because otherwise it's just this all or nothing thing. You're either get in this giant wagon or not. And it feels like a lifelong decision um, and just too, it's just been too scary in the past. And this makes it a lot easier to start and just get going without a big commitment or confession. I'd just like to add something to that, if I may. Uh, you know, we talk about the stigma of addiction and addiction treatment, but there's also a stigma that doesn't get talked about if you don't readily endorse, I'm going to be abstinent tomorrow. Uh, and so it keeps a lot of people away. And so being able to feel that it's okay to take your time uh, and we're here for you and we, you know, empathize with that position, I think is really important. Oh, I'd love to echo that. I, I think in my own journey, like I just celebrated 20 years, which I used to just blast all over the internet because I'm a recover out loud person. And over the past few years, I've stopped. Like I didn't share it on social media because I don't, define real recovery or enduring recovery as abstinence anymore, which may be, you know, treason in my, in my former like mm -hmm. social circles. But for me, I really have fully embraced that the end goal for many people is something totally personal. Um, and we can't really expect that. It's also very exclusive. I'm like the 1% who got sober that way. And it worked out for me with the right care. Um, but it's incredibly exclusive and it's not fair to people to expect them to have that crazy standard. And even clinicians, like we have to do a lot of education around recovery dialects to get clinicians to start calling relapse recurrence, um, to not call drug tests clean and dirty, to use these frameworks that we're growing out of, but we haven't as a field fully transitioned to treating this as like a normalized health struggle as opposed to this like punitive dirty thing that we have to get behind and get people completely abstinent from. We have to take the morality out of a treatment um, because it is treated like a moral failing. Totally. Yeah. 
such great advice. I'm so excited to promote this session far and wide because uh, a lot of people need to hear these messages. And congratulations, Lisa. I thought we were the same age. How have you been able to do anything for 20 years? That's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, three kids, 40, you know. Wow. But I'm, I'm grateful. I, I, it is, I had, I had the blessing of a reverse intervention on my 20 year anniversary where like friends and all these people that got sober through knowing me or knowing people who knew me um, showed up. And it was cool because you do see these sort of network effects of how recovery gets this very, you have one person's sobriety or one person's path, like impact hundreds, if not thousands of other people. And technology makes that so scalable Whereas before it was like, it depended if you were, you know, where you landed, where you ended up living, ended up determining your fate in a lot of ways. Yes. You never know. You never know who you'll impact. Um, I love that. Thank you. Um, So another population that I want to make sure to address is um, folks in rural areas. Um, Rural populations are frequently in treatment deserts and they've struggled with access Uh, especially for substance use care, specialty care. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how virtual care is bridging that gap, of course? Absolutely. So we have, you know, as much as we work hard at trying to uh, enlarge our network, there just are not providers in many areas. And so we see a lot of uh, patients, uh, potential patients, who really don't have access to care. Uh, One of the, uh, I think, good things that happened in the pandemic is the relaxation of the Ryan Hate Act, where we were able to uh, offer uh, MAT to individuals who could not find an in-person provider. And I certainly hope that that continues to be the case. Uh, so the virtual uh, the virtual space has actually increased the availability of care tremendously. And uh, that, that's so very important. Yeah, we see this a ton in our work too. I when if you went from March, 2020 to June, like just seeing in different states where we were operating like Michigan and California, just whole areas of the Inland Empire light up or the upper peninsula in Michigan, like as someone who knows how economically disenfranchised those areas are, like just what sorts of deserts they are at this time for any kind of healthcare, let alone mental healthcare, but oftentimes just, you know, two to five hour drive to primary care, basic care in some areas. Um, It was really heartwarming and exciting to see people adopt virtual care and then realize it's this whole world that now we can, you know, refer to other virtual care specialty centers for MSK, for all these other conditions. Once people get comfortable, we start to have just much more democratically available, high quality health care that normally you, you would just not have if you weren't in the coast or in a place with an academic medical center. And it's been super inspiring. I hope it doesn't turn around. And uh, Mm. people did drive eight hours from Escanaba to to a work at clinic to do those visits before that change. And it just was very silly and made no sense and unsafe for people to do. And why we would do that for like 15 minute, 30 minute visits to take someone's blood pressure or something that can totally be done virtually. It just doesn't make sense anymore. And I think, you know, we have to sort of convince the public of that, but if you step back and look at it from a clinical safety perspective, it's so clear that doesn't make any sense. And our outcomes are so much stronger in the virtual because it's so much easier to jump in that I I think it's not even a contest anymore. Like, is this suboptimal care? We get higher retention this way because it's so accessible. So why would we take that away, that access away? And a lot less missed appointments. Um, I certainly see that in my own private practice, that I rarely have missed appointments where they were much greater when I was in an office. And the and the ability to deliver um, integrative care, instead of having to go to a, phys- a medical physician's office and then to an addiction treatment center, two different places, there aren't many programs that have that kind of comprehensive care. It's so much easier to deliver virtually. Right. And you reminded me, we've got quite a few policy sessions and excited to see how that landscape changes because some good things, I have to say, have come out of the pandemic, namely around expanded access around telehealth and um, at least one bright note. So hope to see that continued expansion. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, 
Dr. Dumani, I'd like to just ask you real quick. Uh, I know with so many substance use solutions on the market, um, you mentioned a few reasons why you are attracted to work at health, um, adolescence, the ability to address so many co-occurring conditions. Any other things that really stood out to you as you sought them out? Well, I remember in December of 2019 attending a Chicago meeting that was really for the Medicaid space, but I was asked by the company to go, even though I work on the commercial side. And that's where we were looking at a number of solutions presentations. And uh, Work at Health, of course, was one of the presenters. I think yourself, Lisa, presented there. And just in prep for this, for this recording, I, I dug out my old notes and I saw that I had evaluated what I heard and, you know, work that I had given three stars to. So there was something that I think the passion and the reason for uh, beginning the company at all really made an impression on us. And then when we saw that not only do you, are you in favor of uh, comprehensive care, uh, integrated care, MAT is a very important uh, uh piece of care that we still struggle with some of our providers who, who just pay lip service to it if they even use much of it at all. Uh, the ability to uh, connect patients virtually 24-7, uh, the ease at which people can come into care. I think uh, the stats are uh, almost 90% within five days can see a provider. Um, as well, the ability to have 24-7 uh, coaching uh, and peer experiences is very important because what we really know is that loneliness, isolation, which is part of the reason the pandemic accelerated the number of patients with addiction so greatly, uh, is something that's really a problem for people suffering from mental health and addictive problems. And if they have a week between set, between meetings with their, their usual providers, what are they going to do? They have many crisis moments and a program like this allows them to connect with a person at any time when they need them. And so that really enhances retention and more importantly, outcomes of treatment. Thank you both so much. Um, Lisa, you mentioned something earlier that I, I don't want to forget. It was around the fact that We've got a lot of point solutions on the market today, but I understand that WorkIt has taken a whole person approach. Can you talk about that and, and why it's important? Sure. There was this major shift where we used to be known very much as a tele-MAT provider, as one of the early adopters out in the marketplace. But I think it was the three years into delivering those services that I started to have people in my neighborhood, have um, friends who are risky drinkers, check out and call work it. And we just started to organically be known as like that Weight Watchers for Addiction, which led to people reaching out who had been sober for a long time, for instance. So Friends of mine who say were 15 years sober, but knew work it was going on and were having trouble finding a psychiatrist that understood their addiction, but needed to treat depression and perimenopausal depression in a different way because of their history of addiction would say, can work it help me now. And so I think as we started to see that, it became so organic to say that you have different needs over your life cycle with addiction, um, but that you always have a special affinity with care that understands your condition. Like I've had to do a lot of education of PCPs that I have an addiction. I got sober when I was 22. Many docs were like, oh, you were so young. It was no big deal. And I'm like, no, it really, it really, it really was. And so having that familiarity with a whole person model that understands that, hey, maybe women in this population struggle with certain kinds of birth control because it's more triggering or um, need specific types of primary care related to their hepatitis C or related to key things that go on in part of recovery. That's usually information that happens peer to peer on the ground um, and is why peer communities are so important and work it's been able to deliver some of that both medically and through the peer piece so that you close some of those gaps and people don't end up on the wrong form of birth control and relapsing or going into a surgery really nervous they're going to get the wrong opioids and relapse. Um, and, you know, just giving people, preparing people for those moments over the life course when they're going to need support. I think that's when we became more of like a Mayo Clinic for addiction virtually than a Tala MIT program because it just organically went there. Um, and it's it's a great place to be. It's, it's really needed. And there's enough things around addiction that are specific that it makes sense to have a special type of addiction centered home for those needs. Thanks so much for bringing attention to those. Um, and, 
you know, earlier we talked about COVID and um, I made the mistake of even saying post-COVID. Unfortunately, we're still not quite there, but particularly we're definitely not there in terms of the impacts and the ongoing nature of post-COVID, especially around substance use. Um, Can you talk a little bit about maybe any concerning mental health or addiction trends, um, at least that have stood out to you that unfortunately are probably going to be ongoing? So I'm thinking that we had some uh, positive news before the pandemic that perhaps the overdoses related to opiate use disorders was starting to decline, but they've increased again. What's not very publicized is alcohol deaths. Alcohol deaths are increasing. And we've also got a resurgence of methamphetamine, often in combination with opiate use disorders. It's also resurging. And so um, the the pandemic has really kindled a lot of uh, of addiction processes, uh, in part because of isolation, in part because of the the ability to connect with even some of the care that they were getting started to to decrease. Um, It was how I got back into private practice because my husband, who's an addiction psychiatrist, decided to retire. And so I said, oh, no, you can't. Let me help. (laughs) So I expanded my time. Uh, There's a great need. We know a lot of of uh, both therapists and, and psychiatrists have left have left treatment, and there was not so much uh, ability to even connect in IOPs and PHPs uh, because of uh, because of the pandemic and the uh, fear that people had of uh, you know causing more and more disease. So the need has escalated tremendously again. Yeah, to echo that alcohol piece, I, one of my profound memories from social work training was being in Katrina and responding to Katrina and all of the meetings disappearing after the storm. And so you would have people really triggered by this traumatic event and just not have a place to go because the normal orient, recovery-oriented systems of care were not available. And that was one of the first times I really thought, oh, virtual can play a really important role here because you end up in the maze just calling numbers to try to find a meeting somewhere. And COVID really highlighted those gaps. And then the gaps with anonymity, with people trying to transition meetings online, but people could be screenshotted or all the privacy and issues that came with that just became really accelerated and plus the loneliness. And I think regular Americans were drinking 15% more than they were. Um, So you have all these people that would never have really gone from pre-contemplation that far in that ended up in over their heads pretty quickly. Um, I just see that just in neighborhoods in my community that um, parents drinking a ton more alcohol, a ton of people on those um, gambling apps, DraftKings, like those are the two things that have been like a balm for people during this that have really gotten out of hand, that and video games. Yeah, um, things are still pretty dire, but um, I'd like to end on a positive note. So if I could ask you both, what's your hope for the future of substance use care? Well, let me start. I would like to see, as as I said earlier, that that Ryan Hate Act actually continue to be relaxed so that it's not a barrier to ongoing care. Um, I'd like to see more and more uh, providers in the space who offer a variety of different solutions. Not everybody is amenable to uh, a digital solution. There are still those that prefer in person. So we do have to have uh, availability of of all kinds of modalities. And we have to really um, be attuned to patient preference. Uh, I hope that the um, harm reduction effort continues and is adopted by many more people. And I hope that we can impact stigma. There's stigma in amongst providers, there's stigma in pharmacies, uh, there's stigma even within um, within 12 step groups. Uh, you know, I've had many a patient who had, we don't see very many pure addictions anymore. And I've, I've had people who, want, who went to AA meetings and were told they weren't welcome there because they use something else as well. So we've got to tackle the, um, the, the stigma as well. 
For me, I'd like to see more of that whole body approach to it where we don't have to pick our major and our minors. You still do that and work it, but I think the poly substance nature is just the core. Like I never knew anyone who just used one substance um, when I was drinking or using drugs as an adolescent. Um, and so just letting people just be their whole selves and access care in hybrid environments, wherever they want to, you know, drop in environment in a retail center, um, or like a CVS, a, you know, actually getting it from their phone, just making it so easy to whatever format you prefer to be able to just go. I think we have the tools to do that now because the pandemic's made us brilliant at it. And it's, it's exciting. I think that's a huge shift and something to get excited about and people not waiting for two hours at the ER to then have someone say, you need to go to treatment. Um, here's some fluids. I think that's going to be just awesome. Just if we just get that pattern changed, we'll have you know created a revolution in the care paradigm. I would like to add two other wishes that which there would be more uh, treatment in the person's home environment, that more families would be engaged in treatment as well, and that people be permitted to remain long term with a group because being able to maintain an ongoing relationship with a program therapist provider, what have you, uh, really does help keep them in care and make them feel comfortable about accessing treatment. Thank you both. This has been really inspiring. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm sure our audience will as well. Uh, Dr. Dumani, Lisa, thank you both. Um, for the folks who are listening, please follow up, learn more about this great partnership and the work that both Edna and Workit are doing. And thank you both for your time.